trust and obey, 414 in your hymnals, go ahead and open up to that. There's no super high notes. I will let you guys stay seated. God is good.
plan was to practice last night before, but obviously being kept up till two with the kids, I didn't get a lot of practice, so I apologize ahead of time. Truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, 
despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. Father, make the word clear, we pray. And I pray that it won't be just a message, but that it will reach our hearts and turn into something that really touches our lives, directs our lives, changes our lives, directs us where we need to be directed. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. The Apostle Paul is writing to Timothy and he warns that there will be times when it's hard to stay true to the gospel of truth because there will be periods of church history, within church history, of a serious apostasy and its effects. Now apostasy, what is that? It means that somebody professes to be a believer, but in reality they're not. And uh, in general, there's a thought here that there will be those who reject the true gospel. We are living in very troubling times right now where the gospel is not received by many. And there are many who don't believe that there is uh, a truth in the gospel. But really, this passage sort of seems to bring it home to the church as we'll see they they sort of creep in to the church or churches and uh, cause a lot of problem now since people will reject the gospel the message to Timothy is you should diligently remain faithful to the true gospel and this passage shows us a few reasons this morning. We'll look at those reasons. As we look at verses 1 through 4, we see here that when there is a rejection of the true gospel, there are negative effects. Now, this is something that we need to have people come to understand more and more. Uh, it's not good what happens and the turnout, the results, when you reject the true gospel that we have before us here. It's a very negative thing. It's destructive. And we see it here. He talks about these people that reject the gospel, and he goes through a list of things that characterize them, and you see that those who reject the true gospel will pervert moral decency. Now, as I said, we're living in a, a day and age where there are people that don't believe there is an absolute moral standard, that morals are determined by what you personally believe. And that there is no God who establishes a moral standard. And, and we look at our society and we can see how that's turning out. And it, as we read through this list that characterizes people who follow this kind of uh, false teaching, we can say, wow, that's true right here in America. That's true in our world right now. People who have rejected God and rejected Jesus Christ and rejected the scriptures, woo. It's pretty negative. These people will materialize throughout seasons of the last days. Now, as uh, many churchgoers read this passage, and uh, many believers read this passage, the first thing we think of as the last days is, oh, just before the time that Jesus comes, right? Just before he comes, that's the last days. But actually, the last days incorporate much more than that. 
As the Apostle Paul writes, he believed that they were already in the last days. The last days include all the period of history from when the church began till the time Jesus comes. And in fact, as he writes, he says that Timothy was to turn away from such men, indicating that he was already living in the time when these things would be true. They existed in Timothy's day, as you see in the last part of verse 5, from such turn away. And they emerged throughout church history. And the, the word that's used for times is a word that indicates seasons of time. And there would be seasons of time throughout church history, or there will be seasons of time throughout church history, where these kinds of people will emerge. They'll come out throughout church history. Uh, again, I'll just take you to another passage of Scripture that indicates this thought that they last days include more than just the previous time just before Jesus comes in 1st John chapter 2 and verse 18 it says better get there little children it is the last time and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come even now are there many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. So we are living in those last days and we can expect to see these apostates emerge throughout church history. Now as we look at the passage, we see that these people will make tough seasons during the last days. Perilous times means really hard times, distressing times. And we can see that it's difficult because of the character that they present and it, it makes it hard for others to have a true character and to stand true to the faith and the true gospel when everybody else is rejecting it and denying it and making it very difficult uh, with the kind of uh, living that's going on around them to stay true. Now it's important as we go into verse 2 here to see that the first thing that is mentioned, if not the first two, are really the key to the rest because it's as a result of this problem that the other things function the way they do. And I would say at least primarily this first thought, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. You see, it's telling us here that they focus on sinful self. The, literally, it means that they are selfish. Lovers of self means they're selfish. They're looking out for their own self-interest. Now, the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians, that no man ever yet hated his own body, and if you love your wife the way you're supposed to, you love yourself. That, that, it's the two different words for love, by the way. There in Ephesians, it uses the word uh, agape, and this uses a different word. And I don't know, I'll pronounce it right off the top of my head, philatus or something along that line. But uh, that word in Ephesians is the idea that, and the context makes it clear that a man will take care, a proper kind of care, for his well being, to provide and to protect. This here goes beyond that and is the whole idea that I'm totally narcissistic. I'm thinking only about myself. And this is the thought that he gives here. Now the Word of God tells us uh, the kind of thought that we should have when it comes to love and the proper kind of love that we should have in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15. And in that verse it says, and that he died for all that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. 
but unto him which died for them and rose again. We're not supposed to be living for ourselves, but for the Lord Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again. And so instead of thinking only about self, I ought to be thinking about the one who brought redemption, the Lord Jesus Christ. As a result of this self-love, they function in simple selfishness. And I, I, I'll just go through some of the things here that were mentioned and give a, a brief definition and and I thought about putting it in your notes so it was all down, but there wasn't enough room. So you, you're just going to have to pay attention, I guess. Best you can, all right? First of all, it mentions that they are covetous. You know, when you're thinking only of yourself, actually what the, the word means is uh, they're self-lovers and they're money lovers. They love money. Uh, we do have a passage in Scripture that says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Money itself isn't that. Uh, that's often misquoted, but the love of money is. And uh, these love money to gratify those selfish desires. They're boasters. They're braggarts who make a big display of themselves. They're proud. They're arrogant to appear above others. They're blasphemers. They use abusive speaking towards others. And God, well, no one else counts, you see. It's all about me. They're disobedient to parents. Now, that, that means they have a self-will. And they're against parental authority. Again, it's all about self here. They're unthankful. That means they're ungrateful. And the reason is they don't feel any dependence on others. And probably have the idea that I deserve it or I'm entitled to it. They're unholy. They have no respect for that which is sacred. They're without natural affection, and we can see that in various areas. The normal things that would and should include love, like the family. Look at how many divorces that we have among people. How many parents abandon their children? Look at the unnatural affection in the LGBT. Uh, I almost got it out without failing. This sodomites, I'll put it that way. Uh, there's all kinds of unnatural affection. Truth breakers. They're hostile and they won't allow forgiveness or peace. False accusers. Actually, they're using the word in the Greek that's used for the devil, diabolos. They're slanderers. The devil is our slanderer. He goes before the Lord and, and slanders us. They're incontinent. That means they don't have any self-control. They're fierce. The idea of being unrestrained like wild beasts or uncivilized. They're despisers of those are, that are good. That, that really means they're haters of good. They hate good and they hate do-gooders. They're traitors. They betray others to bring them ruin. They're heady. That means they're headstrong, rash, reckless. They're high-minded. That means they are conceited or self-important. They're lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God. That's a desire to gratify fleshly appetites. And that would be appetites of the flesh of all different kinds. Uh, and uh, that could even include food, by the way. Uh, 
And they amuse themselves with entertainment rather than to please God. There was a Roman poet and satirist named Juvenal that came up with an expression for the Romans back in the day when the Romans were in power and uh, were uh, enjoying, as it were, their many things. And the statement was, bread and circuses. And what he was saying is that the mobs of the Romans would cry for bread and the circuses. Now the circuses included all kinds of entertainment, including the chariot races, the uh, theater, and the Colosseums, where people would uh, do things a lot like uh, what they do on our uh, ultimate fighting contests and whatnot, beat the living daylights out of one another, and they would even go so far as to kill each other in the Colosseums as people sat there in an overcrowded Colosseum that would only hold a hundred and some thousand, uh, uh, but they crammed them into over 200,000 people watching others uh, go through these races or fighting to the death. And uh, they would cry according to this uh, satire, bread and circuses. They called all of this the circus. And what he was saying is that the mob of the Romans, all they carried, cared about was welfare and entertainment. Now it doesn't mean that our sports and some of our other kinds of entertainment in and of themselves are necessarily all that bad, although some of them are. The ultimate fighting thing I'd say is pretty violent. But uh, the thing is, uh, we get so caught up, just like, and these people that he's talking about get caught up, and all they're concerned about is feed me and or uh, give me welfare and give me entertainment. And we've even gotten to that in our churches, haven't we? Where right now the churches, many of the churches, are trying to compete with the world when it comes to entertainment. I had a professor or two in school that were really good on this and, th and one said, uh, listen, uh, the church is going to discover that it cannot compete with the world when it comes to entertainment. And the thing that you'll discover in churches is what you are gaining them with, you keep them with, and you always have to come up with an encore. So eventually, the things that are pleasing them now won't be enough. And so now we've got to the point where we have to have more and more professional-like entertainers on the stages in our churches to keep people interested. And we can see this kind of thing rather than lovers of God. You know, the Lord has told us how that can be combated. And that is found in the greatest commandment. The, it was asked of the Lord Jesus, which is the, the greatest commandment. And he said this, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. Love the Lord thy God with everything you are and everything you got. And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. You know, years ago I learned a little song as a child, and it's still been kept alive throughout many years. I don't know if they sing it much now, but that it's built on the word joy. And some of you older generation will remember the thought and what the words mean in an acrostic. And here's the, the proper way to have joy. Jesus, others, then you. Jesus first, others next, then you. And these people turn that all around and it's all about self. And so everything else gets perverted. And they are no longer decent, morally speaking. The second reason to remain faithful to the true gospel is found in verses 5 to 9. 
that is, those who reject the true gospel will pretend religious devotion. Now, it tells us here in verse 5, they have a form of godliness. That means a semblance. It looks like the real thing. They will appear religious but will carry out the unholy. As I said, we're talking about this really infecting the church. Maybe not the true church, but it, it, throughout the churches and throughout different ages, this has happened, uh, throughout different seasons of church history, this has happened where these kinds of people have gotten, gotten into the church, into the church leadership positions even. And they appear to be religious. There are still people who carry out some of these characteristics, but they have some form of religion, and they're formalistic. They'll go through the, the religious rites and traditions and ceremonies and practice their religion, but it says they deny the real power behind it. And the real power behind it everything is the gospel that salvation is through the Lord Jesus Christ and a change life for the glory of God and for the good of the person and, the, and society all happens as a result of putting your faith in Lord Jesus Christ and having him save you from your sin and they deny the true gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ and they pretend religion they have religion they don't have a relationship with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're powerless practically to live a godly life because they don't have God. It's a lot like the movies. You know, they put up these sets for the movies. We did a similar thing when I was in high school. I was asked to be a part of a play. It's the only one I ever was a part of, and hallelujah, I'm glad of that. Uh, we did the music man. And they had these things that made it look like a town on the stage. Of course, we weren't nearly as professional as the movies. And you'd step through the door and on the back of that it just the rest of the stage and some wood and stuff that held it up there. The front looks all nice and like a town, but behind there, nothing. No town there. Same thing with the movie sets. Uh, I was in the place outside of Keystone called Meeting the Need. They uh, used that location to make a movie that's going to be out soon. It's a horror movie. And they had a, he showed us the, the guy that's a caretaker took us on a little tour of the place and the, he showed us the haunted outhouse. And this big monster comes up out of the seat of the outhouse. Sounds gross, doesn't it? But he showed us the prop, how they made this all happen. You know, of course, in the movie, it's going to look like it really came up out of a, a horrible place. Well, it's not as horrible as it looks because I know what's going on there. See, they, and the same way with the movie. It, the facade looks so real. But behind it, there's really nothing there. And that's what he's saying. These put on a big religious facade, but there's nothing there to, of any reality of a relationship with God and any power to change a life and make it what it ought to be. They appear religious, but will charm the weak. And really, the idea here is, he says, this sort are they which creep in or worm their way in to houses and lead captive little women or silly women, which means weak women, who are already laden with sins. Their conscience has probably already plagued them as, as what they can do. Is there anything that they can 
uh, offer that will help me deal with this overburdened conscience. And so they worm their way in and charm the weak. And it says uh, that it is women here. Now that doesn't mean that they're the only ones that ever get caught. But evidently, as we look throughout history, it seems to confirm it that the women are very susceptible. And throughout history, you'll find quite a few times that God has uh, allowed these kinds of people to uh, to do their dirty work, and and it has affected women who get got caught up in cults that started false teachings of various kinds. And somebody brought up with the look at how many wives that the. Uh, uh, polygamists have and so forth they're looking for, for some sort of answer and they get caught up and they're led captive into their false teaching and they appear religious but will combat the truth now Janice and Jambres are never mentioned in the Old Testament but there was some documentations of that period of time that Paul evidently knew about and Timothy knew about that gave some sort of teaching that these were two Egyptian mag uh, magicians who during this time that Moses was appearing before Pharaoh they withstood him and, uh, and so he uses their names because they were familiar with that to get the story across how they withstood Moses. These withstand the truth and the truth tellers, the gospel teachers, they're actually in opposition against them. Now he says they will not succeed. They will proceed no further in their attempt to overthrow the truth. Eventually, God is going to reveal them for who they really are. And through periods of church history, there have been times that these false teachings have been exposed and no longer made, avail uh, made effective. Now, there is one aspect here that I just want to bring forward, and as we go later on, we'll see it again, Lord willing. In verse 13, it says, Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So it will continue to progress and get worse, and just before the Lord Jesus does come, it will be at some of its worst. And that's why many of us believe that we're very close to Jesus returning because it's about the worst it's been. And there are other things that indicate his return may be at any moment. Of course, the Apostle Paul thought his return was imminent. He thought he could be possibly one of those that experienced the rapture of the Lord Jesus Christ, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. But as we look at how the world is going, it is getting worse and worse. And you say, well, will they be stopped? Well, if not directly during this period of the church age, after Jesus takes his church home, he will judge these people and expose them for the false teachers that they really are. And when Jesus sets up his kingdom on this earth, he will show who is true and reveal the truth to the world. Now the Apostle Paul tells Timothy just exactly how he ought to respond. And he says that he should not have anything to do with them. From such turn away. Now that can have a couple of uh, thoughts. Number one, don't go into their fellowship. It is important where you worship and who you fellowship with. And I tell you, there are churches of all kinds, and we may have some differences here and there, but when it comes to the foundational truths of the Word of God, if they're denying those truths, have no fellowship. That doesn't necessarily mean to not have any contact with them. The Lord Jesus, as He prayed in John 17, 
He said, Lord, I'm asking you to keep them in the world, but not of it, basically. How are you going to reach out to the world with the truth if you don't have some sort of contact with them? But if they refuse to listen, then there's a point where you have to say, well, that's in God's hands. But I don't have the fellowship with them. And I shouldn't. On the other side, don't let them into your fellowship. Don't encourage them into your fellowship. See, what a lot of times the problem is, is uh, uh, we've invited this kind of evil into our churches and encourage people. Now, does that mean they can't attend? No, not necessarily that. As long as they're not causing open trouble, they're not allowed to teach and whatnot. But... Uh, you know, if they're coming to hear the word and hopefully God can change them and they're not causing trouble, let them attend. But definitely don't let them into the membership. Don't let them have any kind of teaching responsibility or any kind of authority within the church. Have nothing to do with these people in the way of fellowship. Use truth to combat error. The best way to combat error is the truth. Now, if they don't receive it, again, that's up. You leave that in God's hands, but at least give them the truth and let God expose their falsehood and who they really are in His own timing. Trust God to do that. When it comes to you personally, let the truth of the gospel guide you and keep you from destructive thinking and living because if you're not living according to the truth, it is destructive. Shall we pray? Father, I pray that you would keep us seeking the truth, living the truth, sharing the truth, and abiding by the truth. I pray for anyone here today that may have heard the truth and yet hasn't responded to it and placed their faith in Jesus Christ, that they will do so. I pray, Father, that you'll give us courage and boldness boldness to stand in difficult times where the truth isn't readily accepted and there are those who are opposing the truth, openly opposing it. pray that you'll keep us from buckling and just trust you. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Closing, let's sing this final song. You need Jesus as your Savior and you need somebody to help you with that. We'd be glad to do that. You can come while we sing and by coming say would you help me I want to, I want to trust Jesus and to save you 548 have you any room for Jesus let's stand together as we sing 548 have you any room for Jesus he who bore your load of sin and ask submission Sinner will you let him in Room for Jesus King of glory Hasten now his word of glory